Coming up on this episode of STV, we're looking at oddball sleds. This should be fun, so stick around. STV is brought to you by Yamaha revs your heart. 509, fueling your passion. And by Polaris, think outside. Oddball sleds are nothing new in the snowmobile industry. I mean, even when you think about it, back in the day, those early sleds were pretty oddball if you think of the early Elisons or even JAB's first offerings. But if it wasn't for those pioneering visionaries back then and others along the way, I mean, who knows where this industry would be today? Recently, at the Toronto International Snowmobile, ATV and Power Sports Show, we came across a couple of new oddball sleds, beginning with the Bobslaw. The Bobslaw is a new way of electric motion on snow. It's a combination of plastic body and two independently driven rubber trucks uh, propelled by electric motors. It's more agile. You are sitting almost on snow. Uh, your center mass is very low. There is almost no chance to roll over. Yeah, you can drift. It's very, very agile uh, whatsoever. And it, of course, it doesn't have pollution. It doesn't have noise because it's electric. Bob's was coming to North America it was a kind of a brainchild of a group of us and uh, talking with Sergey and seeing the success that he had out in uh, Switzerland and Austria and just the kind of amount of fun we think that these machines could bring to the North American market. This machine is not a traditional snowmobile uh, in any way, shape or form. We're not trying to take over the trails with it. Um, this machine is built solely to uh, be a fun uh, extra thing to add to different environments. The ride experience for Bobsla really stems from uh, how fun the learning curve is and how untraditional the experience is. Now for those with experience with skid steers or zero turns, uh, it might come a little bit easier, but uh, when you put a novice, either snowmobile rider or just anyone in the Bobsla, uh, the first few minutes is about getting used to it, and then after that it's about perfecting the ride, and that's what keeps it fun, is because you can constantly try and get a little bit better, um, and as you get a little bit better, you get a little bit faster, and you can start to play around with it a bit more. So uh, overall, the experience is, is unique, I would say. The simplicity of Bobsa, it makes it really user-friendly to all ages and levels of involvement in the snowmobiling or just outdoors world for the winter sports side of things. Um, it's opened up a lot of doors to people who have not maybe the confidence to get on a traditional snowmobile. Uh, they really, really enjoy the look and feel of the Bobsla. The bobslaw machine actually looks like a lot of fun with its skid steer style controls. Now, it's definitely not a machine you're gonna hop on and do a high mile day out on the trails or venture into the back country and set a high mark with. Instead, it is what it is. And that's a machine that's a lot of fun in the right environment. Now, I haven't ridden one yet, but I definitely want to. The next oddball we came across was the Widescape WS250, a stand-on sled. Widescape is a super light uh, snowmobile. It's made for off-trail riding. Uh, it is very nimble. It is different from everything on the market right now. So what makes the Widescape unique is because it's a stand-up snowmobile. So it's a totally different driving experience than what we're used to, uh, to see on the market. So it has the same uh, control as the regular snowmobile, but it's a thumb throttle instead of being a finger throttle or a twist throttle. And uh, it has the brake on the left hand side. So uh, anybody that's uh, used to power sport driving or driving all the kind of machine uh, will get the feel pretty, uh, pretty easily. 
So the WS250 weighs only 200 pounds total, which makes it uh, probably the lightest uh, snowmobile to go off trail riding. It's equipped with a 250cc uh, four-stroke engine. It's our engine. We developed our own power plant. It's equipped with a CVT transmission made by CVTEC. And uh, yeah, it has 12-inch uh, tracks and suspension up front and the rear. It's adjustable to your weight. So the best environment to ride the Whitescape is really in deep snow condition. That's what it's meant for. It shines in five, six feet of snow and it's super light. So it makes it very easy to go in all kind of terrain. This is another sled simply for having fun on the snow. And just like the bobsled, I think anyone of any skill level can hop on these machines and have a whole lot of fun in the white stuff. It's hard to say what impact these very untraditional oddball sleds will have on the modern snowmobile design, but what is amazing is the accomplishment of the builders just bringing them to market because both of these snow machines are available for you to bring home. And as far as the saying goes, the one that dies with the most toys wins, well, adding these toys to your garage will definitely get you on the podium. Coming up after the break, we're going to look at some sleds that never made it to market, but definitely made it on this oddball list. This segment is brought to you by Polaris. Oddball sleds are nothing new, but there was way more of them back in the early days of snowmobiling, back when the definition of what a snowmobile was was maybe still a little fuzzy. Plus, you had all of those manufacturers out there all trying to build a better mousetrap. Today, these sleds are now found only in private collections or museums, and time has proven many of these designs a failure, but they are sure interesting to look at. STV has had the chance to visit quite a few museums over the seasons, and there have been a couple extraordinary oddball standouts. One memorable oddball is Big Al, a four-engine, 12-cylinder behemoth of a snowmobile built by the Alouette Company and designed by custom car guru George Barris. Now, it's built more as a showpiece. Performance was implied more than proven, and they were definitely smoking the good stuff when they came up with this bad boy. I think the only thing missing is a fuzzy steering wheel cover and maybe more metal flake. Now, we came across this machine at the Cochrane Vintage Riders Snowmobile Museum. Another great place to visit is the Top of the Lakes Museum in upstate Michigan. Now, this collection changes all the time, but here we came across the Articat Boss Cat 3. Built for speed, the Boss Cat was one of a few dragster-style machines that were all the rage back in the day. Other Boss Cats included a V8 Chevy-powered sled and a turbine machine that, surprisingly, caught fire and burned. Recently, on a road trip down to southern Pennsylvania, we had the privilege to connect with Bob Sell, who has an amazing vintage snowmobile collection and is also the owner of FNS Yamaha and Marine. Now, in a past episode of STV, we were able to walk you through just some of the amazing sleds that Bob has in his collection, but we did leave out two key snowmobiles, so here they are now. <laughs> what? Did you think we were going to leave you hanging on these forever? Bob has a bunch of interesting survivors and unique hard-to-find machines in his collection, but two units really stood out. The first is a crazy prototype built by Evinrude, the side-by-side -side snowmobile. This was one only ever built. Uh, it's called the SSS. It was a concept sled, mm -hmm. one of the brass at Evinrude. Older guy, didn't think snowmobiling is too cold, you're out in the open. We need to make something that... We need to refine it. Yeah, yes. refine it, and mom will want to ride in it. And they put yeah. stock OMC uh, opposed, I call them squish squash engines, this is what powered this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Reverse, electric start, heater, radio, single ski, twin 20 inch tracks under this thing. Yeah. Probably so, not gonna set the world on fire for a land speed record this yeah. one. No. no. Very slow, uh, but, but, re but refined. Exactly. You could drive this with dignity. So Who wants to be out in the snow and the, and the they cold? They got this yeah. thing built, took it around the shows as a concept. Mm -hmm. Of course, then the brass started to see how much this thing was going to cost. This would have been incredibly expensive. Even for Wide the Wide for the trails of the day, because you remember yeah. this was made in 69. Mm -hmm. Groomed trails were just, just coming into play in yeah. very few places yet. But it's amazing to look at. I mean... It's beautiful, 
but very boaty on the inside. You can tell this is Even coming the out outside, of... Even the outside, this is boaty. Well, yeah, yeah. The, the, the windshield. And but it has seats out of uh, Evinrude boats because of that era, Evinrude and Johnson were building their own fiberglass boats, yeah. and that yeah. is the seat right out of there. And even how the console is and the steering yes. wheel, everything, again... Looks Instrumentation is marine. Very boat, you know, yeah. Because it's and, a marine color. And carpeted inside, which you'd have on the inside of a fiberglass boat back then. Yeah. Same thing. So there again, popular science, popular mechanics, ran stories on it. You know, yeah. snowmobile of the future, blah, blah, blah. Took it around to some snowmobile shows of that era. Yeah. I mean, it's an anomaly, uh, an oddity, an interesting sled. Very good. I thought I was pretty knowledgeable about old sleds, but this Evinru prototype was one I had never heard of before, and it was pretty neat to be up close to this oddball. Now maybe it was ahead of its time, or it would have been too expensive to produce, but it sure would have been neat to cruise a frozen lake in this machine. But as cool as the Evinru is, it isn't near as spectacular as the golden hot rod sitting next to it. Coming up after the break, Bob is going to tell us about the Johnson Pegasus. This segment is brought to you by Ultimax Belts. When I first walked into the room and laid eyes on the Pegasus, I was at a loss for words. I mean, I was told that Bob's collection was pretty spectacular and he had some unique units in there, but who would expect something like the Pegasus? Plus to think that back in the day it actually performed? I mean, all I can remember was thinking, what a death trap this thing is. Talk to me about this, because I want to know about this, and I think a lot of other people do as well. So in the early 70s, there was a world speed record war going on. Mm -hmm. Polaris, Cat, Skidoo, Snow Pony, so, bunch of companies had this war going on. Yeah, so this goes to all those fancy sleds that had the multiple engines in them. Boss and, Cat 1, Polaris yeah. XR4, Skidoo, blah, blah, blah. So that's the, that's the scene, uh, that's, setting the scene of the That's the scene. Yeah. So OMC sleds were very durable, but they were noted as heavy family blah sleds. Yeah. So they wanted to spruce up their performance image. So they went to the outboard racing department, mm -hmm. got two hot V4 powerheads that they were on the boat race circuit with, yeah. borrowed them, 
put it in here. Now it had potential. Till all this got done, now we're at the end of the 71 winter. Yeah. And they didn't want to have to wait for another winter for the publicity. So someone got the idea, why don't we go out to Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah? <laughs> no kidding. That's where they set all the speed records. Why can't snow go there? The, the salt's white like snow, so it must be the same. Exactly. So they <laughs> went out with a uh, Johnson Ramp Page Snowmobile, which was their performance sled of the day. Yeah. Not a lot of performance. But they took it out, and it, it would do 60 couple mile an hour on snow at sea level yeah. there in Illinois, southern Wisconsin. So they go out to the salt flats, and the thing went 60 couple mile an hour. Now, there's 4,000 elevation, so it's yeah. a little higher. So good. Still decent air. Similar resistance. Yeah. Similar speed to snow. Let's go. Their biggest challenge was the track. Mm -hmm. Nobody had a track that would hold up over 100 mile an hour for distance. It's a paper thin track, but what happened over 100 mile an hour, the track would get a wave. Yeah. It's bogeys, not yeah. slides. So they put a nitrogen charged rear axle adjust cylinder on this thing. So as the driver would get up over 100, he'd dial nitrogen into this cylinder, which would tighten the track. And then as he slowed down, he had to loosen the track or would have busted the track. Yeah. So the driver had his hands full here. Well, and yeah, hands full. And let's talk about <laughs> what's, what's on the side of this thing. World speed record, 140.625 miles per hour set in August 19th, 1971. 140 miles an hour in this thing. That must have been... Well, it would have been death defying, but it had to be yeah. terrifying as a driver to be. It was be a in rush, there. I'll tell you. So. And it's I parachutes mean, it, on the back. There's no brakes on this thing. I so saw it's that. twin parachutes. That's how they had to woe this thing. <laughs> you definitely have to think <laughs> ahead then. Yeah, I mean, a very simple cockpit and butterfly steering in there. The, the speedometer right in the center. A little tiny speedometer, but I, don't, I suppose when, when this thing's at full tilt, you're not looking at the dash. I doubt you had time to look at that speedo. No, no. Incredible, incredible. With the opportunity to get up close and personal to this sled, I was able to get a good look at all the scary details. You know, I've driven and ridden a bunch of sketchy stuff over the years. But I think if I walked up to this sled and was asked to go as fast as I could across the Bonneville Salt Flats, I would say you were nuts. Actually, I probably would drive it. I bet you it was a thrill. Nowadays, the Pegasus doesn't get out in the daylight very much anymore, but Bob did tell me he has brought it to different snowmobiling events in the past. So maybe one day, if you're lucky, you'll see it out in the wild again because it is definitely something to see. Coming up after the break, I've got one more oddball sled to look at. One that's already changing what we think a modern snowmobile can be. This segment is brought to you by Yamaha. So far, the oddball sleds we've seen on our list have all been prototypes, marketing exercises, or low production units. This next sled looks like a normal snowmobile, but its means of propulsion has already had a huge impact on the cars and trucks we drive out on the road. And that's because this next sled is the Tyega, an all-electric snowmobile. I would definitely consider Tyga as, you know, a traditional snowmobile. From afar, you really can't tell the difference between a gas snowmobile and electric snowmobile other than maybe the sound if you see it moving. The ride experience of a Taiga is definitely unique. What's really cool about it is just like the direct drive. So there's no transmission. We really have, you know, a one-to-one -one ratio belt running the track direct off the drive shaft of the motor. So um, there's basically no latency between you pushing the throttle and having that power delivered to the track. So, um, you know, what comes with that is this incredible sense of control, this really linear throttle curve um, where you're gonna have 100% of your torque at zero RPM. So the same thing all throughout that ramp up, right? So it's super predictable. So 
people who have you know less used to snowmobiling they feel immediately in control and then for the more advanced riders um, they're going to have you know a ton of control coming out of corners going into corners we also have regenerative braking which is really cool so when the track is spinning and you're off throttle the motor is actually you know essentially becoming this this generator and actually putting power back into the system when you're off the throttle so that's um, slowing you down and recapturing the kinetic energy and putting it back into the battery but a hundred kilometers of range and not having temperature have any bearing on that because of the you know advanced thermal management system that we have so um, regardless of the outside temperature the battery temperature the motor temperature are all you know, kept under close watch by our thermal systems to ensure that they're up running at an optimal temperature at all times. With the current range of an electric sled, it probably wouldn't work for the way that I ride a snowmobile, but for some riders out there, or maybe tour groups, an electric option can make perfect sense. Now I've heard a lot of people make fun of or make negative comments about electric snowmobiles or electric vehicles in general for that matter, but there's no denying that in certain circumstances, an electric option can make perfect sense. Even Skidoo has recently announced an electric snowmobile, which shows this niche is growing enough to entice the mainstream manufacturers into the mix. The debate is far from over between electric or ice power or even alternatives like hydrogen, but what is undeniable is that the means of propulsion for all of our vehicles will continue to evolve. These oddball sleds have just been the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the eclectic collection of snowmobiles that have moved across the snow over the last 100 years or so. Hopefully though, we've got another 100 years ahead of us of weird and wacky ideas of what a snowmobile could or should be. Anyways, till next time, keep the skis between the trees. Closed captioning is brought to you by Scott Snowmobile Goggles. STV has been brought to you by Best Western Hotels and Resorts. Wherever life takes you, Best Western is there. Ultimax Belts, performance driven, performance proven. And by Ford F-Series, Canada's best-selling line of pickup trucks for 58 years.